Um, great to be here. Uh, as we said, Zubzin, thanks for having me. So, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the co-founder and the chief evangelist at B45. Uh, we're an application security company and pretty much uh, helping product teams kind of implement a lot of AppSec uh, solutions and helping them scale and things like that. Uh, today, however, we're going to be talking about one of the things that keep me up at night, which is that of threat modeling, but um, really my interests are largely from a perspective from a DevSecOps, from a DevSecOps standpoint, um, building application security and testing 2.0 and things like that. So um, happy to kind of chat and network with anybody else who has similar interests uh, once the program is done. Okay, uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, the core of today's uh, presentation, and I've been kind of more, uh, looking at certain other presentations, so probably for those who are expecting a very deep down technology, a technical presentation, this might be a slight deviation because this is more exploratory from that perspective because of the fact that threat modeling as a domain itself um, is, is, is quite fluid. So this is one of those presentations that I've intended to kind of keep a little bit more, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, fluid, if you will. Um, and essentially, we're going to be kind of presenting uh, some schools of thought of why threat modeling um, possibly fails in um, really large scale uh, AppSec uh, in terms of uh, security programs that have a lot of uh, 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 iterative processes. Uh, and we're also kind of looking at uh, two uh, potential possibilities of trying to kind of uh, see uh, what potential opportunities exist within the threat modeling space for us to kind of have the capabilities to scale it at the speed of product engineering. Um, so that's really uh, the crux of the presentation. Um, and 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 we were going to probably end the presentation with a, a small demo of a threat playbook, which is our open source uh, security uh, threat modeling as code for a fabric that we put out there on Git. And we're going to kind of show you in terms of how we're planning to kind of establish. So let's start off with um, a really um, the state of application security today, right? So we're largely looking at um, an increase in a tool adoption, the SaaS DAST. SDAs or whatever it is, right? So you're kind of seeing a large uh, adoption of tooling, which obviously leads or is intended for uh, higher uh, uh, test iterations. Uh, and thanks to the whole DevSecOps model, we're also seeing a lot of feedback loops, not just shifting left, as probably speaking, but you're also seeing a lot of shift right in terms of adoption of automation and feedback loops at a security monitoring uh, uh, phase as well. Um, and you're also seeing a lot of as a code execution model. It started off with security as code, then went into infrastructure as code. And today, what we're going to be talking about is threat modeling as code, um, because um, code as a fundamental piece of uh, element is something that's really kind of um, uh, being a catalyst, if you will, in terms of um, the whole application security automation space or even the DevSecOps space. We're going to kind of see today in terms of how the as a code model. Uh, fits in within the threat modeling space. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of impetus today in terms of metrics and metadata. And, and, and one of the things that I personally like to follow is in terms of metadata of vulnerabilities, because today, uh, not only are we kind of tracking vulnerabilities from a high, medium, low security perspective, uh, we're also trying to understand in terms of what the potential story uh, behind a vulnerability is, because obviously every vulnerability has a story, and if you start to look at really the metadata that vulnerabilities give out beyond just the traffic light indicators, there's a lot of interesting uh, kind of things that could come up there. But that's for another day. Uh, but uh, really, if you kind of look at threat modeling, and, and this is this is a saying that I really love, um, and something that I put together is, I, you know, if threat modeling, if if, if application security was a website, uh, threat modeling would be the page with the highest bounce rate, because that's simply because of the fact that there's a lot of things said about threat modeling in terms of Cases in the air of the thing that you know you can fix uh, a significant amount of issues even before they're coded, or in terms of saying that uh, you know threat modeling, um, uh, you, you, you know without threat modeling, application security is nothing. So you know there's a lot of lot of things that said about threat modeling, and this is over the last four or five years, and not before that as well. Um, uh, uh, noise. Uh, in the application security world, as far as threat modeling is concerned, in terms of things that threat modeling can achieve and and how it can kind of help application security programs, but really at ground zero, 
uh, this is not necessarily happening because one of the things that I have personally seen in the last decade of working with African security teams is the fact that that necessarily doesn't really translate to real world implementation of threat modeling and more so in terms of implementation of threat modeling, especially in organizations where we see product deployments and application security uh, iterations at scale. So we're talking about people deploying uh, every uh, minute or every hour. And how do you kind of see the same concepts of threat model really kind of fit in, in those kind of uh, uh, infrastructures? So one of the things that we'd like to talk about in terms of why do threat models fail, but before that, I think it's quite essential for us to really understand um, what the definition of threat modeling is. And I think that's really the fundamental building block uh, of looking at threat modeling at scale. And one of the things that I'd really like to kind of compare threat modeling is really uh, with the blind man and the elephant, right? Because uh, you have multiple viewpoints in terms of what threat modeling is, in fact, to the old problem. For a few, threat modeling could be any issues in design and architecture. Um, for certain others in the, in, the, in the developer space, it could be about ascertaining what the countermeasures to threats are. Um, for us in the security domain, it could be an efficient way for us to simulate attack vectors. It could be a way for us to choose technology components, better testing coverage, um, anticipate security incidents, and things like that. But really, the definition of threat modeling is really coming from a perspective of what is your motivation to threat model. It doesn't really matter in terms of what the definition is because I think that's where we're getting really caught up uh, and product teams today are really getting caught up in terms of really finding the sweet spot of what the definition of threat model is as opposed to really understanding what your motivation of threat model is. And as you've seen before, uh, one of the things um, that the whole shift left model uh, is kind of bringing into up against security is the fact that as, as, as much as we're talking about, about breaking the silos between teams, we're also seeing that the silos, there's also a shared sense of responsibility in terms of potential activities like threat modeling that spread across the product engineering life cycle. So obviously threat modeling is not something that was only done with architecture teams. Today threat modeling is something done with security teams, it's done with DevOps teams, it's done with developer teams. So each of them have their own motivations in terms of what they're planning to achieve with threat model. So I think the primary objective uh, before we start to looking at to look at the model is really what the motivations are, uh, and one of the one of the primary reasons in terms of why such models fail is really not is really understanding uh, or not not understanding why we do such modeling, right? Um, and and like we've seen in the previous uh, uh, slide, there there are multiple reasons why you could do such modeling. The fundamental reasons why people started doing such modeling was really to kind of look at uh, 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 potential. Uh, issues at an architectural or at a blueprint level even before you started writing your first kind of code, which is great, which is still valid. Uh, but today it's gone much beyond that. There are multiple reasons or multiple use cases of potentially uh, performing threat modeling. And one of the things that we're going to see today uh, is in terms of the really looking at threat model from an attacker's perspective. Because usually threat model is something that's usually done from a component or a defender's perspective. But we're also going to see in terms of how threat modeling can be used uh, from an attack uh, from an attack perspective, what we'd like to call uh, uh, attack-driven threat modeling. So that's one view of the world in terms of why you would do threat modeling. And like you've seen earlier, there are other views of the world as well. You could do it from an architecture's perspective. You could do it from just uh, just trying to understand what the test coverage of your security testing is. So there are multiple reasons um, in terms of why um, you would need to do threat modeling. So. Before we start talking about threat modeling, before teams really go ahead and start implementing threat modeling, I think there needs to be a very fundamental understanding of why is it that threat model is being done, not just by that organization, but also in terms of why do we need to do threat modeling from that team's perspective as well. So obviously, just like with anything in application security, there is no one size fits all, and that's the beauty of AppSec, right? Uh, and that's also the beauty of, of threat modeling. Uh, there is no one size fits all from a from a threat modeling motivation perspective. And one of the second reasons why threat model, in my opinion, we've seen fails is really because of an overemphasis of how brutality should I use? Should I use a pasta? Uh, framework, do I need to do the NIST, do I use Octave, do I use uh, Stride, uh, you know, if we really start getting uh, bogged, down, bogged down in terms of what methodologies to be used, uh, or, or we start talking about what tool square is, can I use an open source tool, can I use a commercial tool, in terms of, even before we start understanding how to threat modeling, we're talking about uh, tools and things like that, 
uh, and the, the biggest and documentation uh, is really one of the biggest reasons uh, for our failures of threat model because uh, it, you've already made it this huge uh, uh, mountain, if you will, uh, uh, that, that needs to be crossed or climbed uh, before you can even start to get to the other side of, of realizing the benefits of threat modeling, right? And, and, and for others, it's also a matter of self-doubt. Uh, is it complex enough, right? Uh, the, 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 the image that's been built around threat modeling is that it needs to be complex. Right, and uh, that's at least what has been said and said and done. So, so once you think, once you think you've done a threat modeling, you start asking yourself, is this good enough? Is this something that's complex enough um, from an expectation of what a threat model is? Right. So one of the one of the things that I like to say is document what you do and not the other way around. Right. So let's see what works from a threat modeling perspective, and then let's look at formalizing that. So, uh, talking about schools of threat modeling, uh, this is purely from my perspective. Um, I see that there are really kind of two major schools of thought. You have the story-driven threat modeling, and then you have the component-driven threat modeling. And let's look at what each of these things mean. Uh, from a story-driven threat modeling, uh, you're always asking the question of what is, and this is what is the attack-driven threat modeling, the abusive case-driven threat modeling, and so on and so forth. You have multiple names for it, but you want to call it the story-driven threat modeling for this presentation, right? So in a story-driven threat modeling uh, scenario, most of your threat models start off from a what-if scenario. What if this were to happen to your application? So it's more attack-driven. Uh, from a component-driven threat modeling, it's more inside-out. You're essentially kind of really uh, breaking down the architecture and you're kind of seeing in terms of what are all the various components in my application and what are the inherent threats and vulnerabilities that those components might have. So it's more an inside-out perspective, whereas the attack team is more an outside in that point. The fundamental building block of a story threat model are abuse cases. Um, so just you have use cases for application, uh, have one or more abuse cases, right? So abuse cases are one of the more important or almost like the keystones of, uh, of, of threat modeling, uh, uh, of a story-driven threat model. Uh, as a component-driven threat modeling, you're always kind of looking at known issues, right? It's always those known issues, those publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, uh, 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 which have been loaded up and you know for a fact that a particular component has these kind of issues. Like for example, you're going to take an Apache Tomcat server, if you're going to take a, a you know, a particular library that's been used uh, uh, extensively, you know what those known issues are. So that's what a component driven threat model is largely going to be used for. Uh, a story driven threat model is used post design and during development in most cases, as opposed to the traditional component driven threat model, which is usually used pre design and that's, and that's uh, the world view that you know of, right? Because uh, like we said, one of the motivations of threat modeling is for us to kind of look at what the issues are from an architecture perspective. So therefore, from a component-driven threat modeling perspective, we are largely looking at threat models that are used at a pre-design or a design perspective. Who uses story-driven threat modeling? Security professionals and developers and automation engineers. And we'll see why automation engineers kind of can use uh, story-driven threat modeling. But the component-driven threat modeling is also used by architects because obviously, uh, you know, you're kind of looking at uh, uh, really kind of uh, threat models at a blueprint level. So uh, you have that additional persona of an architect uh, coming in from a strong and threat model. The crux of the story driven threat modeling is on depth. And, and, and I want to draw a little bit of parallel in terms of pen testing here as well. So when you pen test an application, especially in terms of applications that have complexities in terms of workflows, they're trying to draw a balance in terms of finding out deep rooted security vulnerabilities that could potentially be found by manual exploits and whatnot, but you're also looking at um, uh, an angle of scale, which is in terms of how well is your coverage. So that's the same school of thought when you get it into threat modeling, because a story is even threat modeling focuses on depth, because remember, it asks you the question, what if, what if this were to happen? What if, uh, you know, there was an attack a vector that did or weaponized a particular vulnerability this way? But in terms of a component cooking on scale, because you're trying to ensure that you have as many components asserted for their potential security issues or known security issues. So 
there's a fundamental difference between soy driven and compound driven, which is that of depth versus scale. And we'll see in the next couple of slides in terms of how you could kind of bring both of these together. Uh, from a soy driven threat modeling perspective, to lose there, but then that's one of the reasons we want to talk about the open source threat playbook platform that we've done. And a lot of them use a lot of manual uh, kind of uh, uh, methodologies to do a soy driven threat modeling. Uh, but you have a lot of commercial variants from a competent threat modeling. And because we don't want to be talking about any specific brands here, we're just going to kind of leave you with, uh, you know, what those could be and uh, happy to chat about it later. Uh, but you do have a lot of commercial platforms in the competent threat modeling space, um, but not so much in the story driven threat modeling perspective, right? So that's really a, a compare and contrast, if you will, between the story driven and the competent threat modeling. So let's look at how what a competent threat modeling is usually we kind of look like, and, and for people who use threat modeling platforms, especially in larger enterprises, I think this is something that you would probably uh, relate to easier because this is what most commercial threat modeling platforms do. Uh, you usually start off with a questionnaire that kind of talks to you about what the technology stack is, uh, then that's where you kind of load up things like what programming language is the application developed on, what are the biggest components that you have, who's your cloud provider, and so on and so forth, and what domain does your application work in? Is it in the financial sector? Is it in the healthcare? Is it retail? And things like that, so that the, the, the associated signatures are kind of loaded on from the back end, and you have uh, you have like a, a correlation between potential threat, potential impact of that application to your business and the vulnerability that it could be subjected to. And then you have a lot of compliance checks. Are you subjected to PCI? Are you in, under HIPAA? Are you under SOC? Uh, and so on and so forth. So you, you fluff that questionnaire, and then it kind of gives you like a map or a diagram where it tells you, here's your process flow, here's your data flow. Uh, this is how your users kind of potentially interact with your application, and things like that. And this is where you'll probably be able to move around those bits and pieces uh, to make it more customized. And then once you've done that, you have a potential list of threats and associated vulnerabilities. And this is where we go back in terms of these platforms being able to work on known issues. So based on the based on uh, uh, the components that you've loaded on uh, in the initial questionnaire, you automatically have a list of threats um, and associated vulnerabilities and countermeasures uh, for those known components. And this is where you're also looking at scale because uh, remember, uh, let's assume that your application uses and for lack of a better number, 250 components application. You load up all your 250 components, and then you already have a fundamental podium on which you're starting off um, uh, your threat modeling exercise because you have those 250 components, and if those are pretty known components, you're going to have 250 uh, components as uh, threats and vulnerabilities. So you're already starting off with a place. And then once you done that, you get to the countermeasure in terms of each of those threats and potential vulnerabilities, then you have uh, your remediation strategies and your validation strategies for each of those vulnerabilities, right? So this is really like a very bird's eye view of what a genetic workflow from a component-driven threat modeling kind of looks like. So let's now look at what is threat modeling, which is something that we really work on because, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've predominantly started off uh, from, 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 from a contesting perspective, from an application security audit perspective. Uh, so therefore, our threat modeling that we do with D45 is largely story-driven. Uh, and one of uh, one of the most easiest way for us to do story driven threat modeling is when we when we give an application to pen test, for example, we start off with something as simple as a, a scribe on a piece of paper that says, okay, this is the application, this is the kind of workflows that the application has. So let me just draw a quick attack tree, right? So so that's how we started off the story driven threat modeling. But then over the last three or four years, we've been able to kind of formalize that into something very interesting that kind of feeds into the security automation systems as well. So we'll talk about that. So from a story driven threat modeling perspective, the anatomy is really this. You have a use case. Every application has multiple cases. Kind of break down a use case, which essentially talks about what the functionality of the application is into an abusive case or an abuse case, which means what can all, what could go wrong with that application. So every use case, would have multiple abuse cases. And each of those abuse cases have something called an attack model, which essentially says, how can that abuse case come to life, which in the security engineering world would potentially mean something like, how can you weaponize that particular vulnerability? So the, the, the anatomy of, of, of the story of threat model is a use case, 
drilling down into one or more abuse cases and then into more than one attack models. Let's look at an example here, right? Uh, let's assume there's an, uh, there's an application where the user story says this. As a user, I want to be able to search for my notes using the search functionality. Let's assume there's a search functionality uh, in that application, and this is you know, just going ahead and searching for your notes. This use case would actually be, as an abuser, I would like to search for notes that do not belong to me, which means you're kind of looking at uh, elevation of privileges, they're kind of looking at breach of confidentiality and things like that. So that could be one use abuse case. The other abuse case could be as an as, as an abuser, I would like to share notes that would steal the victim's uh, account details. So you're talking about more integrity based attacks there as well. So just a just a very very uh, novice kind of uh, abuser case, just for us to get an understanding of how this works. So you have a use case. Those use cases in this example trickle down to two abuse cases. Now, for the first abuse case, you could potentially have three attack models. So how would you potentially weaponize the first abuser case? You could do that using man-in-the-middle attacks. You could do that using injection attacks, command OS, SQL I, if it's, if it's possible. And then you probably do something like a UR redirection when you would kind of take that user somewhere else and then you know be able to kind of steal those uh, credentials and things like that, right? So. Let's assume you have three of those uh, attack uh, models. So what you see here is that one user story now has potentially three potential attack vectors. Now this is really how a story driven set model kind of drills down. And this is a great way, uh, a segue for us to kind of really look at um, set playbook. Now those who are interested, that's the GitHub link there uh, for the set playbook platform. This was something that we open sourced almost three or four years ago. Um, uh, and, and a lot of people have done different things with it. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is a very simple demo that my colleague and I put together. It, it's in a very raw format because we just took a couple of hours and just put this together, but it's really more fluid in terms of what the possibilities are of it. So let's kind of look at, uh, I still hope you're able to see. Uh, uh, so Paul and Adam, can you just give me a quick uh, thumbs up in case you're able to see the browser here because I'm sharing two windows. Yeah, you can see it. So. Awesome, cool, thank you. Okay, so this is the, uh, let me just, okay, so this is the uh, threat modeling, uh, threat playbook uh, interface. And what you see here is that you essentially, and like I said, you could download this from the Git and you could kind of uh, um, do what you want with it. So what you've done here is that we've just loaded up something called an expensor project. And if you look at the expensive project, it would, I just for the for sake of the demo here, I have one user story here that breaks my threat scenarios and vulnerabilities. I'll take you through that. For example, if you look at the uh, user story, I've created one user story called create upload expense, right? So this is a this is an expensive project that essentially means, imagine this is a platform where uh, employees would essentially upload their expenses uh, and for them to kind of get reimbursed uh, from the accounting or the finance department, right? So imagine it's that kind of a, an application here. So one of the user stories here is for you to be able to kind of create upload expense. Uh, user stories as a user, I'm able to create an upload expenses and project limit that have been incurred by me for processing uh, and payment for analysis, right? So any, just any really description here, is not really the point. Uh, so if you look at that user story, we've kind of created three of user stories. And the way we've been able to create this parallelly, I want to talk to you, is by YAML files. So Threat Playbook uh, in the back end really is, uh, really our, our initial files, which is really the uh, fabric that drives them. And for automation engineers, if you're interested, uh, we use a lot of robot framework. Uh, so what we've done is we've been able to kind of develop a lot of robot frameworks for popularly used open source uh, tools, like Zap. We have it for Burp as well. We've got that, we've got NPM audit, we've got a lot of these things. I can send you the link in terms of being able to download those robot scripts. Um, so what you have here is you have this YAML file in which you would be able to kind of create uh, a user, uh, an, a, a use case. Here if you see the use case is to create upload expense and then you give a description here and then you could have multiple use cases here. For example, one of use case could be manipulate expense information, give a description here, and then you could essentially say 
how you would recognize that. So one, you, you could do that in a SQL injection. So if you give something called a repo here, so what you've done is that Set Playbook also has a repository in the background in terms of our instance here, and you've connected that to a database which has all the CWE IDs that are associated with a particular uh, vulnerability. For example, if I just say uh, a reference as SQL injection and CWE3, which means uh, it's a high CWE vulnerability, automatically the repo would pull in the CWE IDs of SQL injection and their associated vulnerability. Uh, so similarly, you can actually go ahead and create as many abuser cases as you would want. So one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, hey, do I need to create these abuser stories uh, uh, every time I have a particular use case? So the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, you would have to create it once, uh, but one of the things they always counter that is uh, you could do something very simple because you are already documenting your user stories today. And as part of Agile AppSec, uh, uh, documenting user stories in Jira or Confluence is already a thing. So all that you, do, uh, all that you need to do is have your user cases kind of documented at the same time. And once you have your user cases documented once, the people who do pen testing, uh, you know this is that a lot of these security cases, a lot of these abuser cases are reusable. So what you're doing is you're creating these smaller abuser cases uh, uh, components that you can essentially kind of mix and match to any application at any given point in time. So you create these abuser cases once, you'll be then able to move them around into multiple applications as well. So this is how you would actually go ahead and create uh, your YAML spec in terms of use cases to abuser cases. Uh, and the key here is really kind of being able to give that reference here in terms of how you would weaponize that vulnerability. So let's go back into the into the UI here. So we have this use case, and we have these three abuser cases. Now, if you click on the abuser case here, you'll be able to expand on what that particular abuser case is, like we saw in the previous example. But if you actually go drill down here, here's where it tells you how you plan to weaponize this particular abuse case. You could do this using SQL injection, you could be using compromise manager password, compromise manager auth token, and now you drill down one level below in terms of the various ways in which you could uh, even, various ways of weaponization, right? For example, you could see if there's SQL injection possibility using an automated vulnerability scan. Uh, you could check this using a manual exploit. Uh, you could run an exploit script, which we'll talk about a little later. You could run an SEA scan, or you could do uh, a static analysis. So these are the various ways in which you could potentially uh, uh, find that particular SQL injection uh, bypass limit. So if we just click on this RMA vulnerability scanning, so here we've talked about what are the various tools that you could put in. If you run that tool, you'll actually see that the test case has been executed. So I'm just going to go back here to the dashboard real quick, uh, and then I'm going to show you in terms of... So if you look at the expensive project here, you'll see the number of scans that you've run. So for this particular project, what I've done is I've run a Zap scan, I've run an NTM audit scan, uh, and I've also done a manual assessment here. So when you look at the scan results from the Node.js scan, for example, you would see that the Node.js scan found four vulnerabilities, out of which one of them was SQL injection, right? You found the CWE89, right? So similarly, you would find that found a SQL injection as well. So you can essentially, what you could do with Threat Playbook is you would um, uh, so the threat model that comes from the left to right perspective, just logically speaking, and then you have the scanners that run on the application and they give you uh, vulnerabilities uh, that they find. And now what you're able to essentially do is you're able to kind of map your threat models to your vulnerabilities. So you can now say how many of your threat models have actually found uh, were kind of uh, were realized by actually scanners finding them, which means that if you found a threat model, now you know for a fact that that threat model was eventually uh, it was kind of the same vulnerability was found by a scanner. So there's that mapping between a threat model to a scan, and on the on the on on, on the, the other side of it is what are all the vulnerabilities that the vulnerabilities that you never thought existed, which means that now you found a vulnerability and there's no associated threat model to it it tells you that your threat modeling can be done better, right? 
So that's just to uh, one of the byproducts, if you will, of using something like Trek Playbook. Like I said, uh, uh, go on to the Git live. There's a lot of videos. There's a lot of material that you put out there in terms of various ways that you could use Trek modeling. And it's completely open source. So you could kind of just uh, use it the way uh, you would want to use. Uh, let me just quickly go back to the presentation. Um, uh, and it's largely used um, using uh, frameworks like uh, the MongoDB, um, a GraphQL, and Python. Um, and it, it's largely used from a uh, story-driven threat modeling perspective. And we said it's a great way for us to kind of map uh, threats to vulnerabilities as well. If you kind of look back to the original use case of use case attack model perspective, what we've been able to do now with that playbook is actually drill down into test cases. So which now tells you how plausible are they, right? So you start off with the use case, the attack model, and now you have the test case level as well. So if you, what I'm trying to get here is now threat modeling can be used as a way to effectively generate security test cases as well. So if you look at it here, you start off with the user story, the same come back um, to a security test case, which essentially means just look at the man-in-the-middle attack, for example. You now have three security test cases for man-in-the-middle attack. You have three more for injection attacks. So going back to our previous example, one of the byproducts of threat modeling is for you to potentially be able to generate effective security test cases. Now, let's talk about how automation comes in here. So now that we have test cases, there are various ways, ways in which you can automate these test cases, right? Uh, so if you look at a test case, there are three things that are possible. A test case is either completely executed by a tool, which means that Zap, Burp, Nmap, Akinetics, whatever it is, that particular test case can be completely executed by a Dash, SAS, or NCA2. That's a tool-driven uh, uh, test case. On the other side, you have completely manual vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities that could never be found by a tool, either because they have very deep business implications or they could be hidden behind authentication uh, uh, mechanisms that scanners may not be able to go in, though you can potentially do uh, a parameterized uh, DAS scan using proxy. But let's assume that there are um, vulnerabilities that are completely manual. So those, you can actually use scripts. Um, you can actually use the same automation fabrics like Selenium, Cucumber, Robot, etc., for us to build security uh, exploit scripts. So just like you have functional testers build security regression, uh, build uh, functional regression uh, scripts using Selenium, Robot, and things like that, you could now use the same automation frameworks to build security exploit scripts. So if you find a manual vulnerability, all that you need to do is you need to write an automation script that mimics the same took uh, to actually find that vulnerability. So that's a completely manual driven uh, uh, security test case. And then you have the hybrid. It actually means it's a combination of tool and script. For example, there are test cases where the tool takes you to a certain level and then you, so you could, you could mimic that using the platform, uh, using the tool as well, uh, the framework as well. You could first run your tool results. You can assert a particular value that comes out of the tool and then you could have your Selenium script, for example, pick up from where the tool left off and then carry out that entire uh, uh, sequence of steps. So that's the hybrid kind of a model. So uh, once you have your test cases in place, you can figure out which of those test cases is catered to by which of these three kinds of uh, building blocks. Is it the tool-related test case? Is it a script or a completely manual test case? Or is it something that's between the two, which is more of a hybrid model? And this is really the whole nine yards, if you will, from a uh, from an automation perspective. This is where I'd like to go back into how threat modeling kind of fits in within the potential product development life cycle, right? So let's say there's a new feature development that's coming in. You first ask yourself the question, has threat modeling been done on that product, yes or no? If it's a yes, you're existing, you go back to your existing threat libraries, and then you pick up those threat libraries, run those test cases on it, and say, is are those test cases enough? or have that, has that component kind of grown beyond that earlier version. If that threat component, if those threat cases are enough, you essentially kind of just map those threat models and then you drive down to your test cases because you already have those threat models. Now, in case if those threat modeling, in case if it's a component for which threat modeling has not been done 
earlier on. This is where it gets interesting because here, going back to our original slide, we want to be able to maintain a balance between depth and scale. What we've done is in case if it's a fresh threat model, especially in larger enterprises where you have the problem of achieving depth and scale, we first run the threat model through the component driven threat model. So you use one of your commercial tools that gives you a fundamental analysis of what the various components are. Then you have your, uh, you have all of your security, uh, all of your threat cases coming from a component driven perspective. Then you run the abuser case threat model on that same component. So the component driven threat model now gives you scale and then the abuser driven threat model now gives you depth. And now you take this combined threat model, uh, which is that of depth and scale, and then you look that back into your test cases. So now what you're able to do is that every iteration, you have the aspect of scale model, combine that with uh, efficiencies of depth, and then you route that through the same automation pipeline, which is that of either hybrid tool or completely manual. Right, um, uh, and, and in this way, what you could do is that you could maintain that whole, uh, uh, it's one way, I'm not saying it's the only way, but this is one way for us to potentially kind of keep up with the speed uh, of, um, of, of of product deployments, because every time there's a new product deployment coming, if you have, so one of the things that we do is, in some organizations, they even have a small Jira plugin, or a Confluence plugin, that does not allow you to commit a user story until you write the association of uh, uh, user stories, right? Uh, so while while architects or business cases are handless and actually writing these user stories, you have a, a, an almost like a, a mandatory form field that makes you, uh, uh, that prompts you to write so cases from that level and start trickling them downwards as well. So that's one way to do it. Um, how does threat modeling fit in back to the Agile um, um, or the whole DevSecOps model? Uh, this is one view of the world that I love. Um, what you see on the top are the traditional building blocks of product development, plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, operate, and monitor. And what you have on the bottom are the, are the building blocks of security engineering, which essentially is threat modeling, SAT, uh, monitoring and attack detection. And what I love about this is that the color code here keeps changing as and when we keep moving forward. A couple of years ago, the color code was very different. So now, if you look at threat modeling, threat modeling is something that not just fits in within the plan phase of the product engineering lifecycle. It's now moved into code as well. SAS, for example, which was now which was always largely in code, has now moved from code into building and testing. That's because of our automation problems have moved from test into release as well, and so on and so forth. So threat modeling, uh, so I, I, one of the things that I love is that threat modeling today has its place in multiple phases as well. For example, just used to model stories at an initial, at a plan and a code phase, for example. Uh, you could use threat modeling to write security test cases, which means that you are kind of using threat modeling or the output of threat modeling into the code and build phase a little bit. Because of the fact that threat modeling also helps you trickle down to security test case automation, you're now seeing the threat modeling's benefits are now being trickled down into the test deploy as well. And finally, uh, uh, we, if you're able to kind of map the potential, uh, the vulnerabilities that the scanners find, um, and then if you're able to kind of map that back to your threat models, you effectively, what you've done is that you've built that, um, you know, one of the benefits of threat modeling in the uh, security monitoring uh, uh, space as well, because now you're kind of using the threats that you uh, uh, that you modeled way up in front, and now you're looking at vulnerabilities that have come now, and then you're kind of mapping both of them to say how many of my threats were actually validated by my scanners, and how many new vulnerabilities that my scanner something that my threat model. Uh, architects were able to uh, kind of comprehend back then. So you're constantly kind of improving your threat models based on what the scanners are finding, and then you're validating your threat models based on the vulnerabilities that the scanners are finding. So this is one way uh, in which you could kind of ensure that threat model, uh, one benefit of threat model kind of kicking down into multiple personas of product engineering. Uh, I think I have five more minutes. I'm almost at the end of my um, uh, presentation here. So in summary, 
Uh, one of the things that I like to say is when you talk about threat modeling, especially in agile application security, know what works best for you because it's not just a one size fits all. Figure out what are you trying to achieve from a threat modeling perspective. Are you trying to achieve efficiencies of if efficiencies of depth, are you trying to ensure that there's some level of threat model that every persona and product is trying to achieve? So really kind of figure out what is it that you'd want to achieve using threat modeling. Um, and always understand there is a potential balance between depth and scale. There's, you have to do that because people who've gone down the route of using just commercial platforms have figured out that there is no depth because commercial platforms or competent doing threat modeling need, will not always give you depth because they have no way to ascertain uh, threats that are more business logic driven, threats that are more exploratory test driven, um, uh, and things like that, right? And people who've gone down that route of only doing uh, threat models based on depth uh, have often come back and realized that, uh, especially in larger organizations, or especially in product teams where you have multiple iterations of the product going. So there's always a balance between threat modeling for depth and threat modeling for scale. And it's very essential for us to really find that minute balance between the two. Uh, the other thing is about making threat modeling more accessible. Uh, we're talking about uh, DevSecOps 2.0, we're talking about breaking silos, we're talking about breaking barriers, both technical and cultural. Uh, so therefore it's only essential that we see that threat modeling is made more accessible. And and in, and we're big suckers for code here at V45. We love doing things in the, as a code model. So Think of getting more accessible, especially if the developer community or with, or with any product engineering community is trying to expose threat modeling in a codified manner as possible, right? So developers love code, so make threat modeling uh, as a code something that they can kind of imbibe. Uh, you probably have a lot of non-code professionals within product engineering, and that's where you'd use, if you look at Robot Framework, for example, they're almost developed in natural language. You can actually write abuser cases in simple, uh, almost conversational English, and they can essentially be translated into, um, uh, uh, you know, what what you do with BDD, for example, right? You can actually translate that into effective uh, test cases as well. So, in in one way or the other, if you can make threat modeling more accessible across parties, that would be great, especially to QA, because it already has the wherewithal to use automation engines and automation fabrics uh, for their uh, gatekeeper functionalities to ensure that validations on an application are done. So there's a very real possibility for us to equip QA for them to use security regressions as well. And that's a great way for us to ensure that you have the same gatekeeper making you know, checks and balances of non-functional and functional requirements. And sequence threat modeling is not always equal to sprint, though it, it, if it's possible, but don't make that mistake of saying that you want to be able percent it all right so we can please get started somewhere and finally uh, the wins of a threat modeling is has to be it needs to be incremental it needs to be consistent and it has to be collaborative because that's really uh, what will kind of give you that 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 uh, depth scale and value in terms of being able to realize something with threat modeling because we've seen enough of set modeling largely failing because you're kind of using one of the two other schools apart. Uh, so with that, I will end my talk here. Uh, thank you once again for giving me an opportunity. And if I have any I... Sorry, one question there quickly. Um, I think we have time for. Have you seen models and their creation and management integrated within existing tool sets today? Um, and any examples? Yeah, I mean, we've seen these models, and one of the examples here is right this. So we've seen Threat Playbook uh, test cases um, um, using fabrics like Threat Playbook integrate with a commercial tool, uh, a commercial threat modeling platform, and both of them have integrated very well into automation. Uh, a framework. So uh, maybe uh, what I can do is I can point I can point you to the GitHub link where we actually have one example uh, where we kind of have these models linked directly into a tool chain. So I can I can probably hunt that down into the team. Sorry about that. It's on mute. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, we're up on time, unfortunately. So um, that was a great talk, and thanks for your time.